On January 21st, 2003, HarperCollins released the first installment of the Warrior Cats series. I think it's safe to say that even 20 plus years later, the Warrior Cats franchise still has a devoted fan base that will keep the series going until either microplastics, World War III, or climate change takes us all. So why does the merchandise for it suck? Hi, I'm Riley, and I've been involved in this fandom against my will since 2013 after my heartbreaking experience of watching Cinder Pelt So Much For My Happy Ending came up on my YouTube page. Anyways, to give more background on this, I am an artist with my own business where I sell my own products that I design called Beyond Time. And I've had to work with manufacturers before, so I'm a little experienced with the production to product pipeline. That is to say, my production and cost overhead is definitely not comparable to a book series that has had over, let's say, 40 million copies sold. So please keep in mind that everything I state here is just informed speculation. I am not a manufacturing expert, nor do I have access to whatever secret undercover information and funds that the Warrior Cat shop has behind the scenes. I am not trying to belittle anyone who has worked on these items in the shop or anyone who likes the products when I might not. Now let's go ahead and get into what exactly the merchandise shop is and what they are selling. I originally had this video in mind after they released the Maple Shade plush back in November, and I ordered one intending to make this video and review the quality of it, and now it is May 2024 as I am writing this. Whoops. I'm going to talk about the items that I did buy back in November. The Squirrel Flight plush, the Maple Shade plush, the Jay Feather enamel pen, the Wind Clan pen, and then the Wind Clan deco art pen. For the pens, I'd say this topic is the one I am most qualified to speak on. Short and simple, Jay Feather is a soft enamel pen, which is why he looks a bit poorer in quality in comparison to the Wind Clan ones. I bought the two Wind Clans at the different styles to compare the quality and execution of each, but honestly, I have no complaints for the pens, really. They're a good price. The only thing I am surprised about is that the Jay Feather soft enamel costs the same as hard enamel pens, but this is probably because the merchandise warehouse has bought a lot of pens, so they are virtually the same cost per pen. They cannot just print order enamel pens, that's just not how it works. To explain this very quickly, hard enamel pens are more expensive to produce than soft enamel pens, and it adds up quickly if you are doing small minimum order quantities such as 50 or 100. This is the price difference between the two styles. However, if you're ordering, say, 5,000 of a design, you're ordering so much that the cost per unit will actually lower significantly so that each pen will only cost you cents. I believe that's why the two are the same price. Their quality is quite standard and true to the product photos. I just think making the minifig of soft enamel pen was a choice that was not really thought out well. Jay Feather's light design gets really unclear and looks very choppy because the minifig has so much detail on a small space and then the metal is just not polished out. It's supposed to look raised. So it just looks like a really busy valley, but it technically is executed very well for a soft enamel pen with that much detail. So I don't have any complaints about the manufacturing quality, I just only have complaints about the art that they chose and why. But I don't really think anyone is here for me to talk about pens for 20 minutes, so let's go ahead and talk about plushies. I'm going to start off with the Squirrel Flight one because I do think she is a good basis for the other plushies, whereas Maple Shade is a bit of an anomaly in her own right. So to start this off, um, I will be comparing these plushies to Webkins as a bit of a gold standard. This is my panda, Webkins. He is probably older than a lot of people watching this video. I've had him since I was eight. He was released in 2009. He has seen a lot of stuff. But I think overall he is in very good condition for his age, and he is probably the closest thing I can compare these Worry Cat plushies to as they're a similar size and pose. And also they took the little paw embroidery and applied it to their plushies as well, so I think Webkins is a good product comparison. Now this guy costs a little more than the Worry Cat's plushies when adjusted for inflation. Keep in mind, he was purchased in 2009 after a fucking financial collapse, so... Um, he is only $5 more than these guys after inflation, and honestly, that is not a great comparison of quality when the price is so similar. I personally despise the entire structure the plushies are built on. If we are talking about kids specifically wanting this, I do not think this price tag makes sense for the quality you're getting. And if you want to argue the high price tag is for collectors, they still need to have a certain quality to them and need to have a bit more substantial structure. Now, I bought the Squirrel Flight plush specifically because she does what I think is one of the worst sins you can commit in plushie design. And as a disclaimer, 
This is my own personal pet peeve. I am certain many people do not even think of this when buying or considering a plushie design. And it's just that the different fur length they've chosen for her tail drives me insane. Now, I understand that the designers really wanted to show off her poofy tail because it is such a key, like, design factor for Squilf. But the fact is that the sudden change in fur length just makes it look very ugly. I no longer have a fluffy cat, but if I have a good video or photo of him to show everyone, I will see if I can find one. But look at how his tail doesn't have the fur poof out like the plushie does. It falls downward because of gravity, and this is how we get fluffy tails from cats. I really wish instead of using a normal tail base and slapping on a longer fur length, the design would have made her tail shaped like a fluffy tail instead of a bottle brush. The difference in these two lengths drives me crazy and it really makes her tail look like an eyesore in my opinion. Now using her as a basis for my general complaints, I do not care for the way they've approached the faces, and I think that is the main factor of why a lot of people don't really like the designs of these plushies. The faces have no dimensionality, and it's like, okay, okay, wait one second. Okay, so I realize this is a bear. However, once again, I think this is a good example of price and product quality. This bear is Buttons from Fluff Nest, and this size cost me around $30. And as a reminder, the Squirrel Flight plushie is $35 before shipping. Now, if we look at Button's face, we can see that he is most definitely a bear. But if we compare him to an actual bear, he doesn't have a long snout that would fit his species. Instead, the design is simplified into easy produced shapes that helped with forming the desired effect and also characterizes its own style. I think the Warrior Cat's plush design is trying a bit too hard to make these guys look real that they end up missing the mark. You can only have so much you can manipulate with a fabric and a limited budget, so you need to simplify things down. We do not need a muzzle that takes up half the face with whisker and whisker pads. There are so many aspects about the Warrior Cats plushies that do not need to be there, but they are, and it just takes away from the entire plushie. I don't think that we need individual whiskers inputted into the whisker pads or even whisker pads in general. I think while realism is neat, some things just don't translate into product the way you intend. I know some people like having whiskers, but for me they're just a bit of a sensory nightmare and an unnecessary cost. One thing I dislike about the face is their choice of eyes. Now, on a case-by-case -case basis, I do prefer embroidered eyes over the eyelet ones that, like, my panda plush has. As a kid, it prevents me from being able to accidentally rip out an eye if it's embroidered in, and it does allow more creative freedom for color, expression, and other unique details. But they, once again, chose realism in the weirdest of ways. This is somehow both over-realistic and not realistic at all. Yes, cat's eye colors does allow them to have that cool streaking color, but on a plush, on embroidery, it looks like the first time I was learning how to draw cat eyes and using DeviantArt Muro, and I discovered that the smudge tool was a thing. And I think it's because they're trying to base it on the official artwork of the books. The way that Owen Richardson renders eyes is like a spiky, darker to lighter effect, but there is no good way to translate that into embroidery. My suggestion for the eyes is simpler is better. A lot of plushies just use a one color option, however you can definitely do something like this where the iris is one color and then you have the sclera around it. Not realistic per se, but I think it translates better. You could also have a black iris and then the actual eye color around it. The cat eye shape itself does read as a cat, but in tandem with the weird head shape, it looks goofy and way too high on the face. I think for the faces, the general solution is to change the muzzles to a simple round circle with the embroidered mouth and nose details and change the eyes to be simplified. I actually made an illustration discussing what I would change for these plushies, so here is a diagram that goes over it very briefly. I'd have the face pattern either directly printed per plush or simplified down further than what I already have here so that they can be stitched together into different pieces. I'd change the fabric to a mochi fabric so it's more enjoyable to touch and easier to clean or repair if there's an accident. Eyes would be simplified to one color but still embroidered. And then if you really want whiskers, they can just have the whisker lines embroidered onto the cheeks so you can have that detail, but it's completely optional. I'd also make it so the muzzle is a circle cut piece instead of the weird bridge nose the plushies currently have. So that way the mouth and nose are connected together and you can see the plushies expression straight ahead without any issue. This also allows for more expressions for the plushies so they can better fit each cat's individual personality. Overall, I think the plushies need a complete revamp. They're not enjoyable for me as a collector to look at, and I think if I was a kid, I would be disappointed with what I got for a Worry Cats plush. 
especially if I wanted to play with these guys outside. Maple shade is like a thousand times worse, but even the fur length on Squilf will mean that the tufts of fur over time are going to be tangled, tugged, pulled, and difficult to clean, which doesn't make it the most ideal children's toy. <laughs> now we are going to be talking about the beast. I am confused in general as to why they made Maple Shade the way she is. They did a really good job of making her unhinged. However, I feel like she's the embodiment of all the issues I brought up earlier multiplied by a million. She's lived on my shelf for around six months now, and she's already got a little cardboard bit stuck in her fur from when my cat cowboy stole her off the shelf and beat the crap out of her next to his scratcher. So once again, not a good plush for cleaning. Her fur texture specifically is the most uncomfortable to touch type of fake fur I've ever felt. And they've sewn in these little felt claws into her feet and they've got hot glue on them. And it just, it makes her so uncomfortable to hold. Once again, this is probably the best character for them to make uncomfortable to hold. However, I do think they could have done her better. For some reason, she's the only one of the current plushies to date to have a new type of face from the base, and they just made it worse somehow. Her product description even pokes fun at this, which makes me think this was 100% on purpose. Mabel Shade's nose is just straight up facing towards the sky in her muzzle, and her eyes are a different shape and are much bigger and take up most of her face compared to the other plushies. She honestly looks like a joke. Her whisker pads specifically are the most egregious because she has that white muzzle. I am not sure why, but the plushie designers are hell-bent on giving everyone black dots for their whisker pads, when in real life, if you look at cats that aren't black and have like a white muzzle, they're just little indents in the fur because that's where the whiskers are coming out. So we shouldn't need to highlight them specifically if you're going to include whiskers coming out regardless. But also they didn't include whisker pads for bristle frost? I do not understand the consistency choices here. But like, even with the other cats who have white muzzles, for some reason Maple Shade has a lot more visibility on hers compared to the others, and it just looks really ugly. So yeah, I think that Kalevi should actually hire me if they want me to design plushies for them. Um, here is my portfolio that they can contact me at. So let's take a look at the store as a whole. I honestly had a bit of a struggle in deciding what exactly I want to tackle first with the storefront, so we'll just scroll through the front page real quick and we'll see. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we gotta talk about this first. So the very first thing I will talk about is the artwork of the minis that are plastered everywhere on this website. I have a very simple explanation as to why they're everywhere, and it's because they are cheaper for them to design with. So I am of the sentiment that the style for the mini figurines is just fine and sometimes even cute. I do think there is a lot of area for improvement generally, but overall I think the style works for the minis and I have very minor gripes with them. However, the Warrior Cats team uses them relentlessly. You want a mug? Bam! J for the mini. You want a tote? Bam! J for the mini with his name. You want a pin? Bam! J for the mini. They really bombard you with them. And once again, this is all speculation, but I believe that the merchandise team uses these as often as they do is because they would rather reuse the assets they spend on designing and making the proof of concept for the minis rather than hire a designer to do more unique pieces. Now, this isn't to say that reusing an element from a previous design and a new one is a bad thing. It's something a lot of companies do. I even do this. That's why you'll see Hello Kitty with the same sitting pose and different apparel pieces, but they're meant to still be unique to themselves. The difference between that and this is that the Hello Kitty one was meant to be put on however many pieces of material you can plaster on her with other elements that are added and changed to make the product unique, as opposed to what looks like a Canva nightmare on a mug. The same thing can also be said about their poster designs and the first ARC book covers. They use them on everything that's not already using the minis. Even though these designs were made uniquely for Warrior Cats, the artwork is just not flexible enough to accommodate all the different products that the team uses them for. They're just simply not built for it. I'll get into the weird product list in a moment, but look at these cushions. First off, I don't know who is dropping 40 plus dollars for this nightmare to live on their couch, but the fabric used for the cushion really pixelates and desaturates the artwork because the material is very, very porous and not tighten it at all. That's why for most cushions you find, it's a solid two or three color pattern. When you have to transition between each color hue for the various gradients, it gets very muddy because there's just not enough space for it to be slapped on. Now, to answer the question of who is buying these, I have no clue, but I can tell you why the merchandise is there. So to preface this on its own, print-on-demand isn't a bad thing. 
I also do this for my apparel because I cannot justify buying my own machine to print my shirts, nor can I ever justify spending the thousands of dollars overseas to have them made in a bulk order and then shipped over. If you are unaware, print-on-demand services are companies who let you plug your little design into their makerspace and then will print it for you when there is a purchase. So if you buy a shirt on my website, I am not the one that's going to be sending it out to you. Someone working at the print company makes it and then ships it to you. At least that is how it is in my case. I've never bought anything that was a print-on-demand item from the Warrior Cat shop, but they're probably not blind shipping if they have this little disclaimer. By the way, blind shipping is when the printer ships out the order to the customer without the seller ever having it in their warehouse or the packaging department. What they're probably doing is once someone orders it, the printing company sends it to the Warrior Cat's fulfillment space in California, and then someone packs your orders with all the items together as opposed to shipping everything separately. This is also probably why their t-shirts are really expensive, all things considering. Now that being said, just because there are a lot of items you can make on these print-on-demand websites doesn't necessarily mean that you should. As mentioned previously with the cushions, some items cannot take the same level of detail as others. Printing something on ceramic is going to look very different than printing on a rough fabric cushion. It just feels really lazy when you have three sets of artwork and you're just rotating them to make more products for the sake of having more. This is also ignoring the price of these things because they're going to run you a bit more than, say, something that is mass manufactured. Benefit being that you don't have to worry about stocking or having enough space for the items or having to worry about not being able to sell the items and just having them sit there forever. But yes, if you are wondering why the price of a cushion that is going to look all muddy and pixelated is over $45 after shipping, it is because it's expensive for them to make and they want to keep their profit margins high. But this mix of using print-on-demand services as well as basically only the mini art, poster art, and first arc new covers as your basis leaves your audience with a merch selection that has a lot of products, but not a lot of variety. Not to mention, these do not make much sense. The Worry Guys merchandise team is guilty time and time again for just making things that make no sense. Now, if you're someone who enjoys these type of designs, that is completely fine. This is more so my brain as someone who likes designing products being like, okay, but why? Starting off with apparel. Now, the piece of apparel that is the most offensive case of just why is probably this mini eyes hoodie. At first, I was going to complain that I understand that what they're trying to do, but it was poor execution. That was until I realized that one of the cats is Brightheart, a non-dark cat. And then I realized that, oh, the only dark cats that are in this hoodie is Cinderpelt, Yellowfang, and Tigerclaw. But for some reason, Jayfeather, Firestar, and Brightheart are here desaturated and darkened. And I am not sure if you guys know this, but if you print only dark colors on your design for a black hoodie, it's going to print out looking really weird. And it does? And then for the t-shirt version, the model isn't even wearing the one that is being advertised, it's different cats. A simpler design would have honestly have just had the cat silhouettes with their eyes glowing, or even just eyes glowing. Even though they might be losing on the character's recognizability, I'd argue that the current characters short of Brightheart are not recognizable unless you look really close. Side note, I really like how they spent the extra money on this hoodie to make sure that the tag is branded, but not for the other hoodies, and they instead just blurred out the apparel company's tag on their product photos. I think that is very funny of them. The other genre of shirt I despise from them is mini plus text. This, I have no clue who it is for. Now, before anyone comes at me being like, oh, well, they're made for kids, you're not the intended audience, I'd like to just come out and say I don't really think it matters when it comes to this. Sure, I think kids are more likely the type of audience to be interested in this, but I feel like when I was 12, I would still be upset if these were my only options. And I was a very cringy teenager. I wore a steampunk skeleton shirt for the majority of my middle school and high school life. Also, I do not know how y'all's parents are, but my parents would be mad as hell at me if they had to buy a $30 shirt that was just a non-rendered PNG with text slapped on it. There are still more creative designs that are a step up, but I feel like these designs are very hard to sell still. The college hoodie one might actually work pretty well if they replace the Firestar minifig artwork with, say, any vectorized drawing of a cat hissing. Then it would be subtle enough to pass off as a legit college hoodie and be easier to wear out for occasions. 
Whilst the Korean text one is very simple, I think it's an example of how I feel that less is more. It really only contains the symbols that are recognizable to readers and if you are able to read Korean. I'm assuming the sleeve translates to warrior cats, but the print on the design of the arm is cool and trendy, and in case you can't tell from my website, I might be biased about sleeve designs. This is an ongoing issue. There are one-offs in the store that are really cool, or could be cool in theory. Many fig renders will prevail because it is easier and cheaper for them to produce in terms of a design standpoint, and this principle will also be applicable to other items I'll be going over. Also, I have Showtune editing my script for me, and for this segment they commented, oh my god, what about the Ravenpaw doubloon shirt? And I've never heard about this apparel design, so I did some digging, and oh my god, I think this is objectively hilarious. It does illustrate very well what I mean about the shirt's designs are very bare minimum effort. The coins on this are a stock photo that they got the rights for, but it goes to show they are not expending money on getting unique art pieces for their merchandise. Showtune also let me know that there is a YouTube, uh, I think their name is Hawks, I'm sorry, I am going off script and I'm in my closet and my cat is scared of the power washing guy outside, but I think their username is Hawks and they made a... I think less than a minute video speed running the Ravenpaw doubloon shirt as a graphic, so take that as you will. The shop has a really bad habit of going with minis plus text plus brush stroke background. These honestly reek of laziness to me because they use these for their totes, shirts, and mugs quite disproportionately. With the exception of the Brightheart head mug, the design choices made don't really give me the feeling as a consumer that anything is meant to excite me enough to buy anything. It's purely meant to take up a space on a website to make it seem more full. I really do not mind the print-on-demand services until it becomes misused and abused like this. I'm not sure how many people are on the design board for these products, and I'm sure that the actual people making these are just following orders given to them by whoever. But the community is full of amazing and talented artists who I know would be so happy to design official Warrior Cats merchandise. I think that the fans would make some really cool products and have wonderful ideas, but instead the design team's limited to pre-existed assets and they don't really do much else. I really think that minifig designs is a good choice only for the minifigs and maybe the little character pens. Short of some weird production errors, the minifigs are uniquely designed to work for that product and that product only, which is fine. The design team just needs to be able to create new designs to accommodate new products. If you want a more in-depth look into the minifigs, I'd say look at Moon Kitty's unboxing videos for them. I think she analyzes them as a consumer very well. They also use the minifig designs in jewelry for some reason. And to me personally, these just don't translate well whatsoever. I'm already not a charm person, but I feel like if we focused on the more iconic symbolism from the books, like a shooting star, a lightning bolt, a leaf that's in the shape of a star that doesn't look like weed, or even just the clan symbols, these charms would be much more recognizable than whatever this is. I cannot tell you which characters are which. I really just want this design team to actually show what they're able to do. I want the merchandise store to be able to grow and make amazing products for a series that I love. And right now, it just feels really lazy and poorly executed. Okay, so I said earlier that there's probably a team with Kulabi that are working on the merchandise for the store. That was my hypothetical, but in looking for info about where their warehouse is for that blind shipping information, I discovered in their FAQ a support email that simply stated warriorcatsuk at eventmerch.com. Now, I'm unsure if you're aware of this, but for companies, having the domain at the end be very consistent is very important. So the fact that this is email isn't shopuscshopwarriorcats.com told me that they're working through a third party for merchandise and fulfillment, which is fine, by the way. I do not want me bringing this up to be an issue. There is a reason why these companies exist. You do not need to have your own in-house team of merchandise and fulfillment experts when you can simply hire someone out of house to do it for you. It is very normal for corporations to do this. So I found the company Event Merchandising and yep, there were you cats case studies on there and I am so glad they chose that banner for it. it really shows off the amazing merchandise and quality of the store. <laughs> But Event Merchandising is a UK-based market developer for brands everywhere, and they basically offer fulfillment and design solutions for various companies. They've worked with a wide range of people, so the question is, why does other merchandise they've helped make stand on its own compared to the Warrior Cats websites? For the Sarah Scribbles website, it 
It's easy for me to assume that since she has a wide range of art for herself, it's much easier to make merchandise to cater to that. And since it's for a single person's company, that means that the creator probably has her hand involved in the production of the merchandise a lot more than Warrior Cats does. The website offers their clients creative products, but who is actually spearheading the product line for the Warrior Cats store? Is there a separate team on their side that just sends over the art and products that they want and then event merchandising fulfills them? Or is there a 45-year-old British man who has never read Warrior Cats in his life being assigned to create plushies for a magical cat series that he doesn't have any insight about? It is so weird to me how this company has integrated itself into the Warrior Cat store because it is very difficult to tell where the third party steps in and where the Warrior Cat staff have had a hand in producing stuff. There are numerous cases of inconsistent product descriptions, links that are meant to be there but just aren't, some option drop boxes that only have one box, repeat information in the product description, things not categorized properly so you cannot find it. The website frankly just doesn't feel really professional or consistent at all. And it'd be one thing if it was one isolated issue between maybe two products, but this is chronic. Honorable mention for this out-of-stock hat that is a low-quality photo of a hat with the clan PNG slept on it that they didn't even bother curving. And also this compact mirror with the J for their mini circle PNG being slapped on it. The only explanation I have for the merchandise looking the way it does is that there is not much quality control or oversight from working partners or collabi in what event merchandising creates. Whether that's from negligence or a genuine belief that what they're making is solid enough to satisfy fans is a whole other story. The real downside to this is that whenever you email their customer support or have an issue with the product, the actual owners of the Warrior Cats IP, working partners or collabi, will probably never get a good range of what feedback fans want, of what they dislike or like about certain products and their design choices. And it especially doesn't help that you cannot leave a review of the item you got on their website, so there is no way to let the other customers know the quality of the item before they buy it unless you go, like, Twitter digging. They're producing bare minimum products with the same million base designs because there isn't an established creative team behind the merchandising website. It's bare bones on purpose because, well, the only thing event merchandising needs to focus on is simply being able to create and fulfill orders on the website. And Kulabi probably doesn't bat an eye as long as their online store is only generating profits for them. That's not to say there aren't people on the team who care about Warrior Cats or the quality of the products that they're putting out. It's more so in a general corporate overview. There isn't much need for them to be involved or invested in creating, engaging, or unique products for fans. They probably not putting a lot of money into the merchandise because they're completely satisfied with their current profit margins as is. Make a bunch of cheap products very quickly and mark it up. Why change it if it's something that is working for them? It just feels really discouraging because at the end of the day, despite the community that has been built over the 20 plus years of the book being released and development of their website trying to be more involved with the fans, it simply falls flat in comparison to the other group's effort. The merchandise that fans do want and still end up buying feels like flat soda. You did order soda, but it's not what you expected, so now you're just left to waste it or drink it and feel sad, or maybe you actually like flat soda. And that is fine. My point is, as of right now, the Worry Cats website is actually run by a team at Working Partners, and the merchandise store is not. The merchandise store feels like a whole other beast that doesn't have invested interest in providing quality items to the people they've partnered with for one reason or another. I could be wrong about this all, by the way, and working partners slash collabi could actually have a designated team of designers that is working very closely with event merchandising, but it just doesn't feel that way right now to me as a fan. But there is such a strong community disconnect between the two websites that it's sort of depressing. I'd love to buy more Worry Cat merchandise, merchandise that I actually want, that is, but there is just no heart being put into 95% of the products that they're putting out. It just feels like lifeless recycled content being used to hopefully get that one grandma to buy her grandson a skirt shirt for his birthday. So the big question is, will this model ever change? And to be honest, I do not have an answer for that in the slightest. The website with its current model does seem to be producing enough profit for themselves that they probably continue operating on it until it proves to be insufficient. I highly doubt that the corporate overlords will look at my video and be like, oh my god, she's right. We need to use other artworks besides the minifig mock-ups. 
So no, I do not think that as of right now, the storefront is going to change anytime soon. That being said, I am really debating about talking the merchandise offered by Ardos that is heavily derived from books, including me, yeah. I think if you see your very talented friend offering to sell stickers of a ginger cat with a white paw, I think your money is going to be much more well spent and valued going that route because at the end of the day, it's really more about the community that has been built up around these books rather than what the original source is offering us. Buying from small artists helps make a larger impact for a much smaller cost than buying a $35 dumpster fire of a plush ever will. And you get the added benefit of knowing that the person who created it is very passionate about the same thing you're passionate about. So please take a moment to support your fellow creatives where you can. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye bye